Good afternoon to you. 406 Now News Talk 105.9 WMAL, where we're making sense of the news. Coming up this very hour from the Daily Wire, Luke Rosiak will be with us. We'll talk about how the Department of Homeland Security had a woman working for it that it was a, an anti-Israel zealot, worked for the Palestinians, and uh, was in charge of vetting asylum seekers here in the United States. Was that a good idea? Luke Rosiak's got the update there. Uh, also, Congressman Matt Rosendale will be with us at 5 o'clock today. Uh, you know, I was just thinking back to September 11th, 2001, when the United States experienced that horrific terror attack on New York, Pennsylvania, Washington, D.C. And what we, what, it, what we experienced in the aftermath of that was a demonstration of, first of all, national unity, right, in the face of terrorism, national unity. American flags everywhere. People came together. And then we also saw international support. I mean, obviously, there were places in the Middle East that were cheering on the attack on the United States, but, but the Western world was very supportive of the United States. Their various parliamentary bodies, government officials, the people of those countries, all coming out, standing in solidarity with America in the wake of that. Do you remember all of this? You know, a little over two decades ago. This past week, we saw Israel get hit by a massive terrorist attack, the slaughter of innocents in the most gruesome possible way. I've seen plenty of the video footage, a lot of it by accident on social media. I don't like looking at it. It is gruesome what happened to these Israeli civilians. And what has the international reaction been? Well, have, has there been support for Israel? Yes, there has. Definitely. Definitely. But we've seen, in terms of people taking to the streets, a lot of anti-Israel sentiment. In fact, people are rallying in support of the terrorism now. Doesn't that seem like a massive sea change from over two decades ago? You didn't see that. Rallies in the West on behalf of terrorism after 9-11? No. After the attack on Israel this past week? Unfortunately, yes. Quite a bit of it. And including right here in the United States. This week, uh, we've had a lot going on. Uh, in the United States Capitol yesterday, we had Rashida Tlaib standing outside whipping an anti-Israel crowd into a frenzy about a fake Israeli attack on a hospital in Gaza. Continue to watch people think it's okay to bomb a hospital with children. You know what's so hard sometimes is watching those videos and... And the people telling the kids don't cry. Yeah, and then uh, they those people then, the insurrectionists then, stormed the Cannon office building, Rotunda, uh, and held position there for hours, disrupting the, the work of the Congress. <laughs> they were chanting for a ceasefire, meaning they want Israel to stop fighting back and defending itself. Uh, and uh, then that led to the arrest, the very slow and mannerly arrest of over 300 of these anti-Israel protesters inside of that congressional office building. For more on this, I want to turn to Mary Margaret Olihan now. She's got full coverage of it. She's a senior reporter for The Daily Signal and a visiting fellow at the Independent Women's Forum. Mary Margaret, great to have you back with us. Great to be here, Vince. What happened yesterday in the Capitol? Well, it was crazy. I was unfortunately not inside. I was outside. But what we know from those who were inside is that these pro-Palestine, um, a lot of them anti-Israel protesters, went in there, sat down in this rotunda, and ultimately forced the police to arrest them. Capitol Police told me that they arrested 305 uh, protesters for illegally protesting inside, and then they arrested three other people for assaulting police officers, which sounds like it happened during the arrest, um, but I, ha I don't have total clarity on that. That was just inside the Capitol building. We know that a lot of other people were arrested outside the White House uh, the day before in these same protests where a lot of the protesters are pro-Palestine, anti-Israel, calling for a ceasefire, and you have this weird sprinkling of people who are carrying signs saying that they are Jewish and that they are advocating for the same things that these pro-Palestine protesters 
are calling for. Yeah, but then when you ask them, will you condemn Hamas, they refuse to do it. They make excuses for the terror group. Yes, that's actually happened. My colleague Tim Kennedy and I, we've had that happen multiple times when we're talking to these people on the ground. For instance, two women I was talking to, and they, I said, will you condemn Hamas? And the woman looked at me as if she had a gotcha question. And she's like, are they committing genocide? And I was like, yes, they are. And she she looked at me like I was insane and then w- still wouldn't condemn, condemn Hamas. So people- <laughs> yes, they are. Yes, that's exactly. In fact, it's in their charter. That's like kind of their whole deal, isn't it? Yes. And these people, they're not very well informed. They're going off a lot of different talking points that they're hearing. Um, and their their inability to defend their positions is really concerning. For example, we asked one woman to explain her sign to us. Um, from the river to the sea, Palestine will soon be free. That's what we hear everywhere. Um, this woman clearly knew what her sign was about, didn't want to explain it to us because she knew that it would not make her look good, yeah. um, in that she was basically calling for the eradication of Israel. Um, but around, around college campuses, these kids, they are either incredibly radical or incredibly uninformed. Yeah, and some are a lot of both. Um, there's a... Uh... So, so additionally, so this is interesting. So you talk about there's over 300 people who were arrested yesterday. They, they were leading an insurrection into the congressional office building. Uh, they were whipped into a frenzy by lies, including by a congresswoman called Rashida Tlaib, who explicitly lied to them outside uh, before they charged the building. Uh, and when they went in, you said that three of them uh, have been charged with assaulting police officers. And additionally, I saw that you tweeted photos of the, the vandalism that occurred because of all of this, meaning they, they defaced some of the congressional building here. What do, what do we know? Yeah, so I asked the cop on the ground about this, and he wouldn't really weigh in. Uh, I also asked the Capitol Police about this, and they haven't gotten back to me yet. But I did get photos of vandalism of these kind of marble structures outside the Capitol buildings. They look like benches, um, but they're more just kind of structures on the side of the road uh, that you can lean on, I guess. Uh, they're decorative, maybe. <laughs> But they say free Palestine in um, big blue lettering. There were two men sitting on the ground right next to the vandalism. I'm not totally sure if they did this themselves. When they saw me taking the picture, they both jumped up and walked away. Uh, But the vandalism behind them says free Palestine and um, something about the liberation now. So that I, I haven't gotten good answers on yet, but I would like to know since It is very public defacement of property, and the policeman I spoke with did say that there would be charges for that, but he wouldn't explain what. Just imagine if one of them were dressed in a Viking helmet, how how bad things would be for them today. Uh, Let's uh, talk about what else you saw. Last night, you were able to capture some footage outside the Israeli embassy in D.C. Here's some of the audio of this. So were these people rallying in support of Israel or were they attacking the country that was just attacked by terrorists? Oh, they were very much attacking the country that was just attacked by terrorists. In fact, they were expressing very strong support for Palestine. Many of their signs were calling for an end to Israel. Uh, My colleague Tim Kennedy, he got uh, pictures of some very concerning signs, including one that said Israel's days are numbered. Uh, Another one that said land you kill land you kill for is not yours. Israel bombs hospitals. Biden pays for it. And I captured one, which I found pretty disturbing, that said Nazi Israel leading the Palestinian Holocaust. So that's just some of the sentiment that was there on the ground. And it was it was insane, Vince, to stand there. On the one side of us, we have the Israeli embassy. You can see the Star of David projected on the side of it in blue lights. And on the other side of us was this huge crowd of protesters carrying Palestinian flags, um, all of them, many of them wearing the Palestinian head covering, um, chanting different slogans such as from the river to the sea, Palestine will soon be free. Uh, one chant called for eradicating um, Israel's border wall. Uh, end the po- they would say end the occupation now, end the siege of Gaza now, tear down Israel's border wall. And at one point, I didn't actually tweet about this because we didn't capture the video. At one point, we heard a bunch of the men start to chant Alul Akbar, and the leader of the protest shut it down. That actually happened again later on. They didn't want that chant happening, but there were people in the crowd trying to 
um, begin that chant. And I thought that was very interesting because there is definitely an attempt by the leaders that a lot of these protests we've been going to yes. to keep it on message. They'll even say, we have prepared what we want the media to take away from this, so do not deter from what we are going to be saying, which I find incredibly interesting. They know they have very, a lot of radicals among them, and they're trying to calm them down. So there's uh, this story I mentioned at the outset of um, the hospital in Gaza that appears to have its, had its parking lot struck by an errant uh, missile from Hamas, uh, and this— this story was originally reported by a, a broad swath of the corporate media as Israel strikes hospital and Hamas killing hundreds. Places like the New York Times and CNN were very quick to jump on that uh, and to advance that lie without actually knowing better. Uh, and then finding out later it was false, they stealth edited the copy. Um, that said, Rashida Tlaib kept advancing the lie anyway because she sees it it's useful for her ide- her twisted ideology. What are people saying at these rallies, if anything, as they as they go and they protest the Israeli embassy? Are they still buying into this idea that the Israeli, excuse me, the Israelis bombed a hospital in Gaza? They are absolutely buying into this idea. And last night we heard the leader of the protest uh, speaking very emotionally to the point of I, I wasn't up close to her, but it sounded like she was crying as she repeated this misinformation and talked about, um, you know, how cruel is Israel is for perpetrating these crimes and, um, you know, the Zionist country, they're saying all these, framing this as Israel targeting hospital, Israel targeting babies and children. And, uh, and then they actually went on to criticize outlets like the Washington Post for not taking their side enough. Uh, they were chanting, uh, I'm trying to find it, Washington Post, you can't hide, you encourage genocide. That was a whole chant that they did, which I found pretty odd considering, you know, Washington Post, New York Times, those outlets were all complicit in spreading this this misinformation immediately when Hamas told us that that Israel had bombed this hospital, when now we're learning that that does not look like it was the case. Um, And so, you know, we're standing there on the ground and I, I was just thinking, wow, the liberal media outlets like New York Times literally fed them this this talking point and now they're all in the streets outside of the israeli embassy and they're all chanting about how how could israel do this to this hospital um it just seems like a direct pipeline of misinformation from these liberal outlets to the streets of dc yes i know and and they're constantly lecturing the rest of us about how we have to be very careful about what we say and don't get things wrong and you could inspire all sorts of hate and violence uh, when in reality, it's the corporate media that seems to be doing that the most. Uh, and this week's a perfect example, unfortunately, uh, of that very phenomenon. Um, Mary Margaret, lastly, I, because I know you track a lot of these kind of the unrest that's going on, the protest movements, the rallies. Uh, is it just my imagination or is, is most of the street activity on behalf of the terrorism here or at the very least a, a, against Israel's very existence – uh, rather than standing in support of Israel, we're not we're not seeing a, a tremendous amount of in the street protests on Israel's behalf. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you, Vince. I haven't seen a ton of pro-Israel protests either. Um, I know we actually have a writer at Daily Signal working on a piece right now on the differences between the pro-Israel protests and the pro-Palestine protests, because you hear a lot of really hateful and um, and vindictive rhetoric at these pro-Palestine protests. Um, that you're not hearing at the pro-Israel protests that have been happening. But but like I said, there aren't a ton of pro-Israel protests or pro-Israel uh, gatherings that I have been seeing. And the very big ones have been all these pro-Palestine people who don't even frame it as pro-Palestine. They call it, they say they're all there for a ceasefire. But then when you look at their signs and you look at what they're saying, they're saying they align with Palestine. And a lot of them are saying they don't want Israel to exist. So it's a very interesting way that they frame their cause um, in just calling for the ceasefire. Mary Margaret, thank you for covering what is uh, important and unfortunately a very uh, a very important moment in American history. Uh, I hope we can come out of it improved and to our senses for sure. Uh, Mary Margaret, thank you very much. We've got some speaker race updates for you. Here's Kevin McCarthy a short while ago. Uh, talking about apparently he did have some sort of hot exchange with Matt Gates behind closed doors today. Can you specifically what happened with Matt Gates? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, 
I was at the mic, I was speaking, and Matt Gates tried to interrupt and say, so I told him to sit down, and we sat down. <laughs> that that's kind of I like that. That's how that's how I would describe it too. Even if it was hot, just like, but yeah, he, he he got a little chippy. I told him to shut up and sit down. He shut up and sat down. <laughs> there is more to this, Yoda. I think. It, no, I told him to sit down. I think I think the entire conference screamed at me. People are listen. <laughs> we, the whole country, oh. I think, would scream at Matt Gates right now. Remember, it was. A crazy eights led by Matt Gates and every single Democrat that put us into this situation. Okay, what, who's coming up with these rhymes? What is that about? Crazy eights led by Matt Gates? Uh, we've never been in this situation before, but how do you have 4% of your conference remove a speaker when 96% are there? This is why. With the rules that you established there, Kevin McCarthy? He had no plan afterwards. Now we have Israel at a war questions whether Congress can act, uh, questions where we'd be able to go to select a new speaker. I mean, it's a difficult situation driven by one person for his own personal beliefs, his own animosity towards me, and his concern about what's inside an ethics complaint that was filed before I was even speaker. Okay, so that's the McCarthy version of events. But remember when Matt Gates, you know, did dethrone McCarthy, the eloquent explanation for that was that McCarthy owed Congress, the orderly budget process. In other words, all of these, these dozens of this one dozen appropriations bills needed to be passed on time and in a responsible way for the American people because we are way underwater right now on our national debt. And so if you're going to become Speaker of the House, you're going to keep to the commitment of getting these bills passed on time. He failed. He lost on that. He didn't keep his promise. He failed. And so Gates comes along and says, well, sorry, you didn't live up to your promise. We're going to invoke the power we had to hold you accountable. And he, and he did. McCarthy not representing any of that aspect of the argument, instead saying, well, he just doesn't like me, House ethics investigation, et cetera, et cetera. What is the, what is the support for the McHenry resolution to give him more powers, and would you need Democrats to come and help you? Well, the, the question in there, we'd like to have all Republicans, but it's, they get into the bunch of legal minds whether they're or not. I just think what? we need to make sure government still runs. And I think we should be having a resolution on the floor in support of Israel. I have a five-point plan to support Israel. But the question right now is you can't do anything until you elect a speaker. And apparently, there's not enough votes to elect a speaker. Should Jim Jordan step down? Uh, look, it took me 15 times to win. So I, I don't question when someone keeps being having the opportunity. Do you think there's some kind of acting up? Look, when I, put, when, I put, when I put McHenry's name down, it was my belief that if I something happened to me, that McHenry could run the floor until we elected a new speaker. It was not my intention when I put a name down that they couldn't do anything. So why would you put a name down? When the president decides on a State of the Union who his de designated survivor is, I think it's his he or her intention that if something happens to everyone else, that that person could carry on the continuity of government. You know, that is interesting. I, I have been wondering, well, they keep making this claim, well, Patrick McH McHenry has no power. Then what is the role exactly? What is the speaker pro temp? What is he supposed to do? And you need to vote to give him some sort of power to keep the business of the House moving? Yeah, it's it's an odd, odd, odd time. Uh, Matt Gates had some remarks too. Is it is that right? These this is these are new remarks from Matt Gates. Okay, we'll bring it all to you ahead on the Vince Colony show. Also, we're going to be joined by Luke Rosiak coming up moments from now as uh, we begin to discover a lot of anti-Israel sentiment inside of the Biden administration. Luke with the latest. Good afternoon to you. 4:35 here News Talk 105.9 WMAL where we're making sense of the news. Coming up top of the hour, Congressman Matt Rosendale. We'll get an update from him on the state of that speaker's race. As you know, a lot of drama there. Also, a preview of Joe Biden's remarks tonight as he attempts to use Israel's suffering to enrich countries that have enriched his family. And you can join us at 888-630-9625, 888-630-WMAL. Uh, real quick on that speaker's race, I played for you this audio from Kevin McCarthy. Can you explain specifically what happened with Matt Gates? Oh, no, 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 no. Um, 
I was at the mic. I was speaking, and Matt Gates tried to interrupt his hand, so I told him to sit down, and he sat down. Yeah, he sat down. Here's Matt Gates moments ago responding on what actually happened. No, first of all, how was it in there? Oh, sorry, Did McCarthy scream at you? Oh, well, you know, he loses his temper sometimes. Maybe it's the Irish in him. But uh, I actually think it was a really productive discussion. He loses his temper sometimes. Maybe it's the Irish in him says Matt Gates, but I actually think it was a productive discussion. So uh, they're still talking and screaming at each other and telling each other to sit down. That's the update uh, there. Uh, meanwhile, the Biden administration has uh, all sorts of people working in and around it who hate Israel, hate Israel, including a woman who up until the last 24 hours has been responsible for vetting asylum claims in the United States uh, but uh, apparently nobody checked into the fact that she once was the spokeswoman for a designated terrorist organization. For more on this, we turn to the man who exposed this story, Luke Rosiak. He's an investigative reporter for The Daily Wire and the author of the book Race to the Bottom. Uh, Luke, great to have you with us today, sir. Hey, Vince. Thanks for having me. Tell me about Nuja Ali. Who is she and what did you discover about her? So she was a spokesman for the PLO when it had an office in D.C. Uh, 2016 to 2017. In, in 20, September of 2017, then-President Donald Trump said, we can't have the PLO have this like fake embassy-like presence in D.C. The PLO's got to be kicked out of D.C. So that left this woman uh, looking for a new job because she wasn't allowed to work for this de uh, designated terrorist organization anymore. And so what happens? She gets hired by the Department of Homeland Security to work as an asylum officer determining who gets to come into the country as a refugee. So when you hear about, you know, we're taking in all these immigrants from Afghanistan or wherever, but don't worry, we've really vetted them. They have to do what's called a credible fear assessment and determine is this person from who's coming through Mexico, are they really a refugee or they just want money? Um, then you also have to vet them to see if they're a security concern. And so that fell to this woman. That was her job as an asylum officer for DHS. Mm -hmm. um, now, you look at her social media profiles on basically every platform she's posting on a daily basis about, you know, F Israel and any Jew who supports Israel, uh, you know, spare me the crocodile tears. Uh, I sure as hell give zero Fs. Just I can't even say most of the things she says because it's so profane. But a lot of... Um, overtly anti-Semitic posts, including um, this month, posting pictures of the uh, Hamas terrorists paragliding in with guns, captioned, free uh, Palestine. And so this is a woman who was a PLO spokeswoman, and she's still that person. I mean, that is her overriding, you know, you look at even her Instagram profile, it says, I'm American born, but Palestinian at heart. Yes. And so this was a person whose job it was to vet the immigrants. Um, but what happened here is either the Department of Homeland Security, which is supposed to be protecting our country against terrorists, either knowingly hired someone who worked very recently for a designated terrorist organization, or they didn't vet the person. They didn't even vet their own employees, which raises the question of how, how can we think that these, these immigrants are being vetted. But how much vetting would you need to do to allow her to continue to stay in the job? She's publicly posting how much she hates Israel and how much she supports terrorism. At some point, you have to say, wait a second, this is a problem. Let's get rid of her. Yeah, and, you know, they have people that are, you know, contractors to do background checks and things like that when you're going through an employment process. I don't have any of those powers. I'm just a journalist that didn't even spend very ta very much time looking into this because it's so it's so public. Yes. Um, and when she's applying for a job, yep. obviously your primary qualification is what was your what was your job before that? And so, you know, the Department of Homeland Security won't tell me whether she applied with PLO on her resume. Uh, I think as part of vetting its employees, the same way they say they vet immigrants. You would presumably call the recent employers for a job, uh, a job reference. And so I asked that to DHS, and it wasn't a, a snarky question. It was an honest one. Did you call the PLO for a job reference when you hired this woman? Because that was one of her most recent employers. Yes. Uh, and they haven't answered that question. Um, they did say uh, last night that she had been placed on administrative leave. She's been placed on administrative leave. Now, one of the reasons why they uh, may have had to do something is because she happened to 
answer your phone call, which uh, is fascinating. And uh, the and and she is not she was not at least in the call with you backing down from her position of supporting terrorism. Uh, you asked her uh, why she supported if she if she was going to continue to support the hang gliding terrorists from Hamas. Here's how she answered. We have censored the audio for your listening experience. Why would you celebrate the hang gliders? I will absolutely celebrate them. I will absolutely bleeping lootly celebrate them bleep halt she said uh to you so she was she was actually very proud of this she was not backing down yesterday was she no i mean this is who she is and you know even if her job hangs in the balance she's not going to change what seems to be her primary allegiance to a foreign government palestine or not even a government but a, a wannabe government uh and, and so yeah i mean she said also she threatened to call the police on me if i wrote about her um, but a lot of, you know, just a lot of threats and, and bluster. And, you know, she's very open about this. This is her, this isn't some uh, part-time mild feelings that she has. It seems like her overriding mission, and even if you look at her bio on Instagram, you know, it's just a very brief bio about you. It says um, to uh, helping the resistance take root in Palestine. Like that is her mission in life. And she embedded in the Department of Homeland Security, and they entrusted her with vetting immigrants and potentially a whole bunch of immigrants from that region may be trying to come over soon. I can't imagine putting this person in a more vulnerable place in terms of a job. You you put the lady who loves terrorism in charge of vetting asylum claims? That's that's one of the craziest stories I've ever heard. And it's totally real. It, you know, Luke, if you if you or I were working alongside this woman on a daily basis, given her behavior to you, a stranger on the phone, it would not be a surprise what her positions are. You amazes me about this story is that they not only hired her in the first place, but that she continued to be working there for years and in such an important capacity, and nobody threw a red flag on this? This is insane to me. Yeah, no, I mean, we all heard the audio you just played. She's not capable of hiding or moderating her, her position. She's very open about it. It's her main thing in life, and apparently she grew up in Dearborn, Michigan, so she's a, you know, she says she's born in America, but she's clearly an unassimilated immigrant who has allegiance to a foreign entity. Um, but again, I mean, that should have been evident on its re on her resume yeah. and as part of the pre-hiring due diligence. I can't fathom what kind of uh, job checks that the DHS is doing if it doesn't include reviewing your recent employers. So obviously, the people who hired her have to answer for that decision uh, in in a, in a just world. Uh, my understanding, based on your reporting, is that this was this predates Biden. This was in 2019 that she was first hired by the federal government during the Trump administration. Do we know who actually made the decision to hire her? No, I don't know. Um, you know, the PLO is obviously a, a socialist Islamist uh, group. And she is, you know, you see this weird alliance between the uh, essentially far right religious fundamentalist Islamists and then the left. Um, and she's, you know, part of her social media is she's she's equally vocal for her hatred of Donald Trump and Republicans and her support of socialists like Bernie Sanders. She's also um, pictured in places like Cuba, where she's standing in front of a sort of a monument to the communist dictator Che Guevara and um, basically smiling and admiring it, um, praising leftist murderous icons like uh, Shakuta, whatever her name is, Shakita Akor, mm -hmm. who fled to Cuba after murdering a cop. Yes. Um, so there's this weird combination of leftism in American politics in order to push um, this Islamist school of thought. Um, and, you know, oddly enough, Trump kicked the PLO out of D.C., but then it was his uh, DHS that yeah. hired this woman. And she's, she's you know, attacking Trump, but his, his own agency hired her, and then Biden moved her over to a new job doing essentially the same thing earlier so this year. After January 6, 2021, uh, it came out that uh, among the people who were in the crowd that went into the Capitol were uh, veterans of the American Armed Forces. And that led to, you remember, the Biden administration imposing a national stand down. They 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 had to basically they wanted to lecture every single member of the military about extremism and vet members of the military to establish whether or not they were extremists. Has DHS announced a similar program to root out terrorism glorifiers within their ranks? No, but it's a great point. I remember it now that you said it and I had kind of forgotten about it because it really was a crazy story. But, you know, I, I 
I've heard of a, quite a number of people that seem to have foreign backgrounds working in this immigration unit, and it does seem to be kind of like the uh, the fox guarding the hen house potentially in some ways. I mean, certainly if you're working as an American official uh, deciding who gets to come into America, your allegiance needs to be to America. Um, but we also need to keep in mind, I think, when they tell us, like, we're going to take boatloads of people from Somalia, but we've vetted them, don't worry. You know, that's always kind of made me think, what, do they have some fancy computer database in Somalia where they've all got uh, social security numbers and you can just match them? Like, it just kind of doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've kind of always suspected that I think it's just impossible for even the most talented and unbiased people to vet some of these people. And now you see, sure enough, the DHS people didn't vet their own employee. And when you look at who that employee is, I think it's kind of impossible to believe that she was saying uh, that she would properly ban Hamas people from coming in instead of claiming to be these downtrodden refugees when actually they, she'd be asked to ban people from, from entering the country for sharing the same beliefs that she herself held. I mean, um, and Senator Tom Cotton has pointed out that harboring these Hamas sympathies is actually reason enough to, under the law, expel foreigners from the country. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, it's it's just amazing. But, like, the reality is if we give them the benefit of the doubt, that is DHS, that they were just too stupid and ignorant to realize who was working for them. Uh, if you give them the benefit of the doubt, what that really means is they don't even know who's working for them. How do they know who's coming into our country? Right. I mean, the job of DHS is to keep our country secure. And if somebody comes in, they should have a sense of who they are. They have no idea who's even working for them. And your reporting just revealed that, Luke Rosiak. Yeah, I don't know which is worse, that they would have, they may have knowingly hired a PLO spokeswoman or that they just didn't vet her because either one sort of has frightening consequences. It's insane. And then one, one more piece. I, I'm seeing from The Washington Post overnight that now there's a State Department official who has resigned citing – an objection to giving Israel arms. Uh, basically, this guy is anti-Israel uh, and is advancing sort of the conspiracy theories around Israel that Israel's slaughtering Palestinians with American-provided arms. So I, I've, this past week has been, I think, deeply clarifying for a lot of people because the lefties who hate Israel, they're all coming out of the woodwork. It's, it has, it's actually a wild experience to see all of them be so... Uh, explicit about their intentions and the left not even know how to handle their own base at this point. Yeah, and there was also a story in Politico uh, about the chief of staff to the uh, comptroller of the Pentagon. So basically the person who's in charge of all the money that the military, U.S. military spends. Um, she had worked for three years for the embassy of Qatar in D.C. So she was working for a foreign ambassador uh, and now she's and, you know, Qatar is the country that is harboring the leadership of Hamas, yes. and Qatar blamed uh, Israel for the terrorist attack on it. And so we have now kind of at, at least two people just Where in this conversation this that we've been having who have allegiance to foreign countries that are now working in our government. Where have we seen this before? Remember after 9-11? You know, Pakistan was covering up and protecting the, the leadership of Al Qaeda and, and Osama bin Laden. Uh, this was all going down. Uh, and that now yet again, Qatar, uh, who is the leadership of Hamas. And it's just it's uh, it's nuts. And it, it all of it, dis it deserves sunlight. And uh, Luke Rosiak, you are doing a good job of giving it a lot of sunlight. Thank you, sir, for all of your time and reporting today. Thank you, Vince. It is. Uh, that's Luke Rosiak. Th that audio, that is unbelievable. She so brazen that she would get on the phone with a reporter and then say, yeah, baby, I support the hang gliding terrorists. Why'd you celebrate the hang gliders? I will absolutely celebrate them. She's, she's been placed on, what is it, administrative leave? <laughs> That's, they decided, they took a middle ground. Well, we have to figure out whether or not we should really fire her. The Biden administration's John Finer, he's the deputy national security advisor, was on ABC this morning with George Stephanopoulos, asked about what's the latest on all of these American hostages that are being held right now in Gaza. Cannot forget about these hostages. So many Americans killed in this terror attack. So many American hostages still being held. What can you tell us? What's the latest on the hostages? Is Qatar making any progress in getting some of them out? 
So we're obviously engaged in, in intensive uh, diplomatic uh, activity related to the hostages, but also uh, have sent a number of experts to the region to consult uh, with Israelis uh, who are involved in hostage uh, extraction. I, I don't want to get ahead of any of those conversations. These are obviously the most sensitive things that we are working on. And the president has said it is a top priority uh, for us to get as many uh, of those hostages out as soon as possible as we absolutely can. Um, okay. As many out as, as soon as we possibly can. How do we normally rescue hostages? If we don't do it with a, uh, a ransom payment, as the Biden administration has done, how do you normally get hostages out, American hostages? We kill bad guys. We send in some of the most elite units on the planet, and we do hostage rescue. I, and normally, my, 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 my sense is you don't want to be the kind of person who takes an American hostage, right? Given the reputation for the units that we have that will destroy your life. They've got a bullet with your name on it. Here's the thing. This is one of the craziest stories and, and just par for the course for this Biden administration. Apparently, while Biden was in Israel, he met with, now this is, this is, the, this is being described as Delta Force. It doesn't matter. These are military guys. These are special operators he's meeting with. The White House posted a photo to Instagram yesterday of Biden shaking hands with these guys. Their face is all exposed on this White House photo. And then about an hour later, they deleted the photo without disclosing what had happened. Millions of people had already viewed this thing, hundreds of thousands based on the count, apparently. Um, and the White House just in the last hour has now confirmed that they did dox U.S. special operators by accident by posting an uncensored photo of them with Biden in Israel. Bill Malusian confirming this. The White House has issued a statement now. As soon as this was brought to our attention, we immediately deleted the photo. We regret the error and any issues this may have caused. And any issues this may have caused. Talk about euphemism. And uh, if this is Delta Force, you know, these guys, the reputation is that Delta Force is even more secretive than the SEALs. My understanding is that that uh, the, the Delta guys kind of like to shake their heads at just how public the SEALs are. In fact, I don't even know if, does the U.S. government officially can even acknowledge the existence of Delta? Well, the White House just posted a photo of a bunch of people's faces, deleted it, and then said, oops, our bad. So just... Add it to the pile. It's the Biden administration for you. Coming up, Matt Rosendale, the congressman, will be with us. He's going to chat with us about the speaker's race. Give us the latest of all of that drama behind closed doors. Did Kevin McCarthy really tell Matt Gates to shut up and sit down? And did Gates take it in stride and suggest it was just the Irish and McCarthy? Well, Matt Rosendale was a witness. He'll tell us.